Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week we're going to cover the K-Box RDL, another staple with the Eccentric K-Box. Make sure that you're able to get the full extension with the straps. You may need it to go a little bit longer than you would initially guess. And from there, I really like to make sure that the middle of my foot is around right where the gap where the strap goes through so that we can make sure that the tether goes straight up and down. From that point, give the wheel a spin, push your hips back, your shoulders locked in, and really work back into those hips. This is a great alternative to using the barbell or a dumbbell for the RDL. Give it a try. It's one your athletes are sure to love. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Being a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat. Well, you could find multiple lectures from each of these top-level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well, all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is going to bring you well over a hundred different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASP today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Ashley, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. No, thank you so much for having me on here. Yeah, so listen, I, I'm fired up about this, and I, I appreciate you taking the step out of the case center really quick, you know, to, to spend some time and talk with us. But before we get going too far, uh, you know, let the you know person and a half who may not know who Ashley Beaver is, you know, who you are, where you're at, and how you got down there to, to Duke. Um. I started in the field in 2009. I um, entered under Mike Buley up at the University of Dayton. Um, I actually met him at a strength and conditioning conference, the National Strength and Conditioning Conference. I was there on vacation and it just happened to be strength and conditioning conference uh, for the CSCS, or for the, I'm sorry, for the CSCS. And um, I was like, I had just graduated with an undergrad in rehabilitation sciences, looking to go physical therapy. And I was like, no, this is it. Like, this is awesome. I just walked around the convention center and emailed Buley and his boss. And two weeks later, I moved to Dayton, Ohio to bartend and work for free. And I have been in it ever since. I went back and finished my master's in Savannah. And I interned again at Duke on the Olympic side and then went up to Army West Point and I was there for two and a half years and got a lot of experience working with technically seven teams were my own, but you get to work with everybody there because everyone's in such a short um, time frame where they can actually uh, do physical activity, uh, sport related physical activity. Uh, and then from there, uh, Duke had opened a position on women's basketball side. Coach Will Stevens has had men's and women's basketball for the 17 years prior to that, before I came down. And so, yeah, five years ago, they opened a position for on the women's side, and here I am. That's awesome. And it's always great to have an A-10 alumnus here, you know, obviously exceptionally biased to that. And Mike's just such a super – awesome human who's done so much to help so many people so that's great to see that that's where you got your start and things kept rolling from there oh yeah I couldn't have asked for a better first um first boss into strength and conditioning he uh he I mean he still pushes me to do things that I'm uncomfortable with but just to make me better um and yeah play was so lucky to pick him up um I think he's gonna do a lot and be able to reach a lot more people um under that platform because he's so smart so smart oh a thousand percent and I think that the idea of pushing yourself to be better and to try to expand and learn and grow um 
is something that we, we wanted to kind of go down that direction and talk about how really this period has allowed you to do some reevaluating uh, before the, the women return to campus. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how is Ashley different as a coach right now? And where are some things that you see and you've learned kind of some better things because of this time off? I think it was interesting. I sat down with our support staff for, for our team, which is myself, our athletic trainer and our physical therapist. Um, and we really started talking back in, you know, uh, around May that, wow, we really have to change how we're going to bring our student athletes back. Um, obviously at the time we didn't know we were going to come off of five months of, of no activity. Um, but I mean, that's the good part about communication and, and having a solid, you know, support system around is um, you do keep in touch and those things, they, those things do happen. So it was a lot of kind of, um, I don't know, just reflecting back and like, okay, how do we break this down? How are we going to bring in athletes who we, we sent them surveys over the summer to see what their kind of restrictions were. Um, do you have access to a weight room? Do you have access to fitness facilities, anything like that? And the number one thing, they all had access to a ball and, and to be able to shoot and work on that kind of stuff. And only one of, you know, our 14 athletes at the time had access to a weight room or any kind of, um, dumbbells or anything like that. So we knew we were, or I knew I was starting at ground zero, negative two when they returned. Um, so it was really just kind of looking at how can we return them safely and hopefully get us strong enough and, you know, conditioned enough to get us through, um, hopefully an entire basketball season. Um, so it was really just kind of peeling back the layers. The other side of it was I talked, um, with a few of our other, uh, ACC women's basketball strength coaches, um, coach Yolanda down at Georgia tech and, and even Caitlin up at Clemson and Jenna Reddy down at wake. And we were just talking about, okay, what, what do we need to do? Like, what are you guys going to do? And really throwing ideas off of each other. Um, and so I guess to go back to actually answering your question is really strip things down. Um, our very first week back, uh, well, the very first week back when they initially got here was just their overall performance measures and biomechanical testing. We didn't do anything else outside of that. Second week back was all body weight activity. I mean, we were doing body weight stuff. I think the, the heaviest we got was using med balls for, for slams and um, a lot, a lot of isometric work. And then from there, kind of just built off of that. So the next week was some sort of isometric work into, you know, whatever our goal was that week, whether it be a bilateral or single lateral uh, or unilateral um, you know, squat variation, um, or anything like that. So the, uh, the underclassmen, even splitting it up, upperclassmen and, and underclassmen, our underclassmen, um, didn't even touch the bar until week four, our upperclassmen, you know, moving into week three, three and four, were able to utilize the bar and add weight to the bar because they've been through the program before. But I mean, our incoming freshmen, I, I, zero training in a weight room. Um, so we really, really pushed it back. And then, you know, following the guidelines as far as conditioning went with the NCAA, uh, what they had put out, that was interesting, but I honestly, like we weren't seeing any kind of, you know, hamstring issue, um, ankle issues by, by utilizing that, which, so it was nice kind of return to play protocol. Um, but we even went further and started having our nutrition um, our nutritionists be a part of our meetings as well. And so how were we going to utilize nutrition, um, to enhance what we were doing and, um, you know, recovery procedures to kind of periodize how we were going to do that. I wanted to elicit a response. I wanted them to be sore. I knew they were going to be sore, you know, those first few weeks back. So maybe the ice bath wasn't exactly what we wanted to do initially. Um, but, you know, maybe giving them the cherry juice, even though it's like full of sugar and we know that it helps with the anti-inflammatory anti response, like maybe that was the better route to go. So we just really, um, 
I think it comes down to communicating with all of the people that you can utilize that you have. I know not all staffs are as fortunate as me to, to have all of those people. Um, but to just reach out to other people in those areas, if you don't and see how you can kind of like holistically pull that all together. Um, yeah. To create that kind of atmosphere, holistic atmosphere for your student athlete. No, I dig it. I think that that's, that's awesome. And I think that the big thing that you were talking about there was really looking at taking a step back and reflecting at what you had done and what this entire group kind of taking a step and, and, as you said, peeling back the layers in order to refine like the preparation process that you uh, you had able to move forward with here. So let's run down that rabbit hole a little bit more because I think that that's something that a lot of coaches like to have talked about. You know, it's like, oh, well, we, we met and we talked about this, that, and the third. But what were the this, that, and the third that started to get pulled away or added in when – this group would sit and talk about what would be a better avenue to take with these young women that you guys get to work with? Um, nope. We, we kind of sat down and had discussed what kind of things that we wanted to see with testing moving forward, just because I feel like this year in particular, we wanted a lot more baseline testing. Not that we hadn't done it before. We, we, we very much did, but it was an opportunity to sit down and look and be like, okay, do we really need to do a, I don't, I don't know, like a hip internal external rotation? What is that doing for us? And how are we utilizing it in the weight room or even in, you know, athletic training room, pre-practice or, or whatever? And can we cut that off and, and do something like a submax, um, submax conditioning test with using like polar to do heart rate? Uh, recovery afterwards. So then we actually have a baseline. So like, heaven forbid, somebody does get COVID, how do we return them back to play properly? Um, so it was really, I mean, at, at almost every avenue of what we were doing, is this going to be important? And is this going to be important to us this year? Um, now, that being said, none of the things that we changed would be bad in a year that wasn't a COVID year. It you know what I mean? Like a submax test um, for anybody, the submax heart rate test and getting that, those baseline numbers for anybody, even just return to play off of an injury could be, you know, something that's utilized. So it's not like we were just doing it because of COVID. Um, but even some of our like strength tests, uh, like m our previous, we also, we went through a lot. <laughs> we had a, not only COVID, but we had a whole staff change. Um, you know, so what, what tests could we even change from a performance standpoint? Because obviously when you work with a, a head coach, sometimes they're very particular at the things that they want to see. And those are their performance markers and they may not be mine. Um, and you just do it because you have to do it. So this was an opportunity for us to look at those kind of things. I don't need them to back squat a one RM. I mean, I could easily do a 10 RM, which would be safer for these very long, very long limbed individuals. Or do I need to, you know, actually focus on single leg exercises and actually get them strong enough and build or try to reduce deficits on each side to hopefully allow us to make it longer in season without injury. And for me, it was no question that the answer was let's work a lot more on you know, single leg exercises and see if we can still elicit your, all the testing that we've, you know, read and had data, they're both going to increase strength. Um, they're both going to increase power. So why not? If, if that's, if we have time for that, why would we not look at that? So it became less about getting in the weight room and doing all of the weight room things that you like, you know, everyone gets excited about, everyone gets excited about testing. Um, yeah. And kind of peeling it back like that. I hope that that answered your question. I feel like I kind of went around. No, that was great. And I think that there's a couple things that were really important that you got into there. The first of which is how it impacted exercise selection. And I think that it's it, just me looking for some, you know, confirmation bias. I'm happy to hear that that's a direction you guys went when it came to 
moving away from more bilateral exercises to unilateral ones because that's actually something we've done and gotten into some other things like that because it's you know we've done it for two reasons first our starting lineup like is all seniors and fifth years like our average age coming back was like we didn't have anybody under the age of 20 returning Mm -hmm. so you know if they've had this much time off it's putting a bar in their back or in like a heavy bar in their hands really the best idea at the present moment um but two you beat me to a punch and i and i was really interested to hear how the second half of your summer all of that changed because typically in this world that we live in right that coaching change happens march april yours happened in july right like and it was quick it was like all of a sudden somebody stepped down and there was a new coach in during a pandemic with no one on campus and all of this time leading in from march up that all these processes have been built well now there's a new leadership so how has that impacted it? How has that, with the support staff putting these things together, where were some things that were taken out and where are some some changes that you see because of, like you mentioned, you know, different coaches are looking at different things? I got extremely lucky in the sense that our new staff, when they got here, they got here when, when the student athletes got back, like literally the same day. Um, and so having a few short meetings with them, because obviously they have plenty to do, um, as a new coaching staff and getting to know their players, uh, she really, Kara really impressed on myself and then the other two members, because we were here previously that you guys need to just do your job and do it to the best of your ability. And I don't need to tell you how to do it, which I think, um, I have not always had that side. I don't want to say freedom, but that kind of freedom and support. Um, But it was very, very refreshing. So it was, you know how to do your job, do your job. And like, I'm not going to have an issue as long as, you know, I'm getting the results I want, basically. (laughs) Um, So that part was really, really nice to hear. And that's kind of when some of the things changed. But again, in the sense of uh, what we were just talking about, which was even the performance testing. Um, you know, one of our previous performance tests was a max push-up test. Um, and it was just something that our previous head coach had done before she was even at Duke when she was at Michigan with their strength coach. And it's something that she loved. And for me, it was a test that I performed because she wanted to see it. Um, and I think we're all, we're like, we've all been there. We've all had to do it, but that's one that I immediately took away because, I mean, there's so many discrepancies as far as limb length and even for us females, you know, chest size and everything like that, like it all plays into effect. And, um, you know, so, Hey, let's figure out something else that's going to work better for us. Um, but also it's just been interesting because it's an interesting time to change culture in August and not, you know, in this, in March, April. So that has, I would say more so than like what we're doing in the weight room. Um, it's more so what we're doing as a team and to build that culture. And so accountability has definitely changed. It's been 180 degrees. And so those sort of things, um, which is, I mean, it's been great. I mean, really impressing that, you know, accountability is not punishment. Accountability is, you know, holding each other to a standard because if we let each other start falling through the cracks, we're going to continue to do it outside of basketball and to compete every single day. um, I mean, that has been her biggest thing. So even if that's something as simple as me adding some sort of competition into the weight room or adding some sort of competition into conditioning, and obviously now as we're moving further into more hours for basketball um they are also doing that on the floor but it that's how that's how she's kind of impacted and changed thus far and and she's uh yeah she's been phenomenal first off i think that what's really neat is how you mentioned those the minor things that you take away as being minor but the big thing being how the new staff is, is kind of 
rebuilding focus, if you may. Um, and it, it's at a, such a trying time of the year leading into a situation right where the kids are coming back off of this break. They don't know what they're getting into. And until like, so we're talking early October, this will come out mid October, right about when we start practice. But until like two years ago or two weeks ago, excuse me, before we started talking, we didn't even know when we were going to play games. Right. If we were going to play games. Mm Mm-hmm. And that to me has to be an exceptional challenge, but you could tell it was one, at least with what has been shown from the outside in that was going to go forward. And if the people here haven't heard uh, coach Lawson's address to the team about competing, um, use the Google bar and and find it. Um, It's not hard. But it, it's something that I think that a lot of these these young people, I don't know, they kind of swing and miss on, like if we're going to be honest, you know, and building that in that time had to have been a unique challenge. It sounds like a fun challenge, but a unique challenge. It was definitely unique. And, and what was interesting is it really did bring on a lot of conversation within our team. Um, because honestly they didn't until she said, you know, working hard is not the same as competing. And then she obviously was a little more in depth than what everyone else saw, but I mean, still the same point across. And it was just very interesting. Their conversations that they were having later about, yeah, you know, I, I came in and I did what I was asked to do and da, 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 but you're, you're, you're right. I don't think I was thinking, uh, was I better than I was the day before? Or, you know, if there is a loose ball, yeah, I mean, I'm going to fight for it, but am I actually competing? And that those were two different things. Um, And it was really interesting. Um, And that's kind of, that's, I mean, you, there was already buy-in. And that's where you saw another, like, kind of big leap for for our women, like, on the buy-in piece of, uh, of buying into the care era. Yeah, and I think that those aha moments are they're exceptional and they're so priceless that it, if you miss it, it's one of those transition periods, I guess you would say. Yeah. Fair or not, because I think some of these kids miss things a little bit too often also, but that's a, it's probably not a podcast conversation. That's probably more <laughs> of a beers on the table conversation. We'll have one of those sometime. Yeah, no, no doubt. You, especially, it's, I mean, you you were under Carl also, great guy. I actually have some some swimmers that are down there with him now from up here, um, which I guess, I, you know, my next question is, is totally different and in a different sense. Um, there's oddly a very large connection to Army West Point and the Duke basketball programs. Let's talk about that connection. I think that that is something that people really misinterpret. And that is how working in the military academies prepared you for the world of college basketball and the misconceptions that people have when it comes to military training, when it comes to the world of college basketball. Um, I think I was first lucky because I grew up in a military, I am a military brat. um, So I got that a little bit before going up to West Point, but it is a completely different um, experience. If, if I had to say one, Um, everything at the military academy is very much a regimen. You have to be places at certain times in certain uniforms you all look the same. You all dress the same. It's if you do look outside of that, that is an issue. Um, and then you get a three to four hour window to do your sport. That's to include your practice. That's to include um, weight room, strength and conditioning time, athletic medicine time, any of that stuff. Oh, and then also on top of that, you need to do your homework. 
<laughs> and occasionally, because I mean, in the mountains of New York, it snows. There's an occasional time that you do get outside of that. So you can use the indoor facility, but then you're, you know, practicing at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> um, and there's a small window of the 5.30 to like 6, but you, it's a hard be done by 6.15 because they have to be in line for breakfast at 6.30 or their entire, you know, whatever company gets in trouble. Um, and it was just very interesting, but something that when I first got there, I felt really like tight about it. You know what I mean? Because they need to be that regimen. So I need to be that regimen. And then when I slowly found out was the weight room was a, an, a place where they got to be individuals. And so it was really a place where they got to show a personality and they love to be in the weight room. Absolutely love to be in the weight room, but you better believe that I needed to be on my P's and Q's because they were going to ask me every question under the sun, why we were doing it what we were doing it for, you know, and then like getting super hyped. And then, oh, by the way, I just gave you like the hardest workout that I could possibly give you. And then turn around and be like, all right, Ash, like, what do you got else? Like, well, like, what else is there? What else are we doing? And you're like, what? That should have crushed you today. Like, no, like not at all. Like, give me more. And then on top of that, they have boxing and combative class. So like, hey, tomorrow I'm going to have a concussion. <laughs> so so you can't also do, you know, X, Y, and Z with me for like two weeks. So it better be like hard today. And it's just, it's crazy. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal people. And every single person at that, at that university has to do something athletic wise. Like every cadet is an athlete. It might not be a division one sport. Everybody has to do something. So they're always like super physical, um, some of the best people inside a weight room like that you could ever ask for ever ever um so that being said when I get down here and then everyone expects oh she just came from a military academy so she's going to be super militant and everything is super you know right on time every everything like that now there are there are definitely things that I learned from West Point and being on time is definitely a pet peeve of mine you will see like if we start at eleven forty-five. Or if we start at noon and it's, um, yeah, 1145 is when you need to start heading up and, and being there at noon, the door is closed. If, if you don't make it in by that time, then I will see you the next morning at 530. That has never, ever changed. Um, that has always been my, because my time is just as important as yours. And I am here for you and I will bend over backwards for you. And, um, you know, and I will have your back if you also have mine, because I plan, you know, you, you're a coach. We plan our day around them. So yeah, five thirty is not fun for me either. I know it seems as though I just love being up at five, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's, it's just a fun treat. Uh, oh, but those, those sort of things. Um, it was definitely a lot of the, a lot of leadership things that you learn from the Academy uh, that, are amazing. If I'm having an issue with a student athlete, a cadet athlete up there, um, you don't take it to the head coach. You don't take it to the other coaches. You take it to the captains. Like captains mean a lot up there. You get extra ranks on your uniform, everything like that. So I spend a lot of time talking to, you know, my specifically my players, but just like their leadership roles and, and how, how that, that captainship was really important because it's not that I don't think that other universities think captainship is important it's like a whole nother level there it's an entirely different meaning and so that was really interesting to see and something that you know we try to also utilize for us like I don't want to take it to your coaches I want you guys to handle it and that that's another part of accountability um and having you guys holding each other accountable so if it gets to the to the point where you have to take it to a head coach then you know it's an issue instead of something that you guys can nip in the bud and use your leadership positions to, to be able to hold each other accountable. Um, and that's 100% something that I, I took from up there. I love it. I think that that's awesome. And I think that that's an experience that could be really beneficial to a lot of coaches. And you never hear anyone coming out of West Point that, that doesn't have just brave things to say about the experience when it comes to growing as a coach. Oh, I mean, it's, yes, you could, you couldn't, 
It's beautiful. Now, I'm the only bad thing you can say is the weather. <laughs> That's only if you don't enjoy snow for nine months out of the year. Yeah, I, I grew up in Rochester, New York, so I know that there's two seasons up there. It's winter and construction, you know, so yeah. it's like... It's winter and filling in the potholes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no doubt. Yes. Well, listen, Ash, let me get you out of here on this. Where, where can people see more of what you're doing? Where can they stay in touch with you? Where can they follow you on social media and all those things? Um, on Instagram, I am just Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-I-G-H. B as in boy and the letter, the letter, the number six. So it's just Ashley B six. And honestly, that's where I post right now. It's currently Squatober. So you may be inundated with a bunch of squats. Um, so I apologize, but usually the stuff is mostly our women's basketball team and what we're doing. Um, and then it's coach Ash B on Twitter. Um, but if you want to reach out or DM or do anything, do it on Instagram. Cause like, that's what I check on daily. No, a hundred percent. And I really am appreciative of your time. This is absolutely awesome. Thank you so much. And we'll be in touch real soon. Thank you. Sweet. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks, Ash. Yeah, no problem.